Aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Lahe'e and my special guest this afternoon is one of the, I would say the, the senior, the senior political commentator uh, in the state of Hawaii right now, Richard Vareka. And I say senior, not necessarily in terms of age, but he's one of the few people that actually has institutional knowledge reaching all the way back from when I was in office. So I, I am so glad that he consented to be our guest. Welcome, Richard. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hello, and, Governor. I'm glad to see you. Well, everybody, you know, if you don't already know, folks, what Richard does, among many things, is that he uh, writes a column every week uh, for the uh, Star Ad Advertiser. And I guess originally with the Star Bulletin, uh, you know, for years. Yes. Now. So you have done this, you're, you and you you talk about politics. And you, you, that just yesterday, last Sunday, you wrote an article about uh, Kai Kaheli and his interview, where he seemed very emotional. What what was that all about? It was very interesting. Uh, Kaheli, of course, is uh, running for governor this year. Uh, and it's it's interesting that this is the third race, the third different race he's been in in uh, six years. So he's been all over the field in what he's running for. But uh, it, it was an interview that was on the Star Advertiser's uh, webpage uh, with Yonji Denise, uh, and she was talking to him about his campaign for governor and he started uh, at first just tearing up a little because he got emotional about how important it is to run for governor as you would know. Uh, but then he uh, several times started uh, not sobbing but crying and there were there were obvious tears glistening on his cheeks as he was uh, talking and um, Yunji twice had to mention during the interview that he was uh, a little broken up with his ex emotion over that, um, which is an interesting thing. I, you don't rarely ever see a political candidate um, do something like that. So, you know, uh, I, that I, was I, what I, my I, column I, was I, about. I don't know whether, I think I saw Clinton once do that, but it was. You know, the subject matter was interesting to me because he was also talking about the fact that he was limiting his uh, contribution. To... Yes, $100 a contribution and not taking money from uh, labor unions or political action committees um, or major major uh, uh, donors that you usually see in, in a campaign year. And it was sort of like he was he was sort of like uh, thinking like coming clean, so to speak. He was saying, uh, from what I gathered, now I, I have to confess, I didn't myself see the interview. And but yes. I talked to some people after I read your column, as a matter of fact. And um, it seemed like he was talking about a change, you know, almost like I'm not taking any money, Bob, and the rest of it, and uh, confessing to that he the fact that he had done what he was no longer going to do. Yes. So on the emotional level, it seemed like he was saying, I got to do this for a wife, for my kids, for, you know, all of and, and getting very emotional, mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, uh, we're giving him the benefit of the doubt. I, I can see where, you know, talking about your family and politics sometimes gets very emotional. I, I've been there, I know. But what about the idea itself? the idea of just taking uh, minor contributions. Now, my understanding is that the reason where you don't take, you sort of limit the contribution number is because that's what you need to do in order to qualify for public financing for the campaign. Well, I guess well, that's what... He... Go ahead. He's very, he's very he's he's uh, he's very low in um, being able to raise. I believe it's two hundred thousand dollars. He's going to need to to be able to qualify for the full uh, match of uh, public 
funding for the his campaign. So he's he's still just around, according to the last figures I looked up, is around a hundred thousand uh, dollars in campaign fundraising. So he's got a way to go. It's just to get money. Period. And the other thing is that because he jumped into this race very late, uh, although he's been rumored and and uh, it, it's been. Uh, an encouraged speculation on his part that he might do something like this, but actually doing it has not happened until just last week. And so uh, he's got a way to go to collect money. And the other thing is that there may not be that much money out there left to get if uh, major donors such as the uh, unions, political action committees, uh, and then just uh, Fat cats with money who like to uh, get involved in politics. So you you think that, that there's a strategic may not be there. There's a strategic purpose for doing this as well as you know seeing the light, so to speak. I mean, uh, well, he may have a strategic purpose, but uh, he his his timing. Just looking at it on a technical basis, his timing is is not very good. There's not he he should have been doing this. Uh, couple of months ago instead of now. I'm, well, I'm let thinking. me ask uh, Richard, because I am so out of touch with it. Um, what is what a, what is the amount of money you can get for a governor's race in public finance these days? Uh, you can get, I think it's $600,000. Um, or I, I may be a little bit off on that, but it, it's not a, a tremendous amount of money, but it's it's money that can go. The last candidate who used public financing for a successful campaign, of course, was David Ige in his uh, first his first uh, run for governor. Yes, and well, it, and I, it worked just fine. Yeah, it seems to. I, I mean, years ago when I was running for lieutenant governor. We mm -hmm. uh, we also did went after public financing, frankly, strategically because I couldn't get any <laughs> couldn't get any more money than the matching amount. But uh, you know, okay. But that brings up a broader issue, which is where I want to go, and that is the 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 problem really is. And let, let me just put it that way because that's how I feel. The problem of money and politics, you know, and it seems to me that we we need to come up with some way of separating the power of power money uh, from politics. So let me give you an example. When I, when I was running, as you know, back in the, the day, uh, people used to you know have these fundraisers, and the idea of the fundraiser was to have a thousand people show up or or some phenomenal oh, yes. number for, and pay like $25 to fundraise. And today what we seem to see is you rather have 25 people show up, eat a few hors d'oeuvres and each give you a thousand as opposed to, you know, working the numbers the other way. And I, I don't know, I, 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 I think that somehow that at least gives the appearance of money being more in control than it ought to be, you know, in my opinion. I, I I think so. I think that that obviously campaigns have to start out with someone, uh, you know, sprinkling some money around. They don't start out of at an, uh, those proverbial grassroots. Uh, they you have to have some backers to go into it. Uh, but yes, it used to be the major candidates would have fundraisers down at Aloha Tower, and you get. Uh, thousands of people showing up, and that would be one way that we would judge uh, the power and the clout that the campaign was going to have. Nowadays, it's almost uh, com completely a measure of how much money a candidate has raised. You know, we always complain about money and uh, being too evil a thing to have in politics, but then at the same time. Uh, us reporters also look at the money that a candidate raises to judge that candidate's credibility going into a, a campaign. So we're sort of both ways on, on that. Um, 
is it how much can you raise and how much can you then spend? So it's uh, if you remember the famous local politi political uh, or local uh, cliche, it says, if can, can, if no can, no can. Okay. And that <laughs> certainly, certainly is true about fundraising in local politics. Well, you know what's um, interesting so, is that today the, 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 ma the only major candidate that I know of, uh, no, there probably are others, but the only major candidate which believes in having these huge rallies and so forth that uh, used to be commonplace in, in Hawaii politics is Donald Trump. <laughs> he can't stand to be in a, anywhere. Uh, you know, he probably doesn't get, actually earn, raise money that way, but he can't stand not to have thousands of people at a rally some uh, someplace you know it's like it's ironic that my party uh, the so-called party the party of the people as we like to describe a democrat um seem to be going the other way you know we we don't do things that seem to bring together hundreds or thousands of people no i i i agree in fact uh, one of the, the last really great uh, local political rallies I can recall was way back when Bill Clinton came out and had the speech uh, at the Ilikai Hotel on the on the beach there. That was a uh, a, a big local uh, rally that just sort of took on a uh, a life of its own. Uh, they've tried a couple of times at McKinley High School to have other other rallies, but we haven't seen the same kind of, of big um, two, three thousand people rallies um, that 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 there were at one time. Yeah, I remember Bob Oshiro used to pride himself on being able to at least look like he was going to fill a little stadium up with people and get, and you know turn elections around. Seemed to have worked, <laughs> you know. Worked for me, so uh, his idea. But yes, yes, he was, he was, I was saying he was he was a great aid to your campaign. <laughs> well, uh, so I tell it, you, it well, just it goes. It. But we we we're going to take a short break right now. We'll we'll be right back. Okay. But when we do come back, I want to talk about money and politics. I want to talk about the yes. fact that there is this aura of uh, corruption that money is corrupting uh, politics in Hawaii. And, uh, but not so much to dwell on the individual cases, but talk a little bit about maybe some of the ideas that uh, yes. people have been tossing around as to how we can improve things. So right now, folks, we're gonna take a short break and we will be right back with Richard Bereka, Dean of Hawaii's Political Commentator. And, and here we are back live. Welcome back to it, Richard Bereka. And I was going to say, Richard, you know, we, we've talked about, we're talking about the influence of money in politics. And as you know, uh, there's been a number of, this, you know, very disappointing uh, situations recently regarding money in politics and, and how it, uh, it seems to be um, corrupting. 
And I was wondering what you would, you know, there was talk in the legislature of, of reforming some of the, uh, uh, some of the fundraising tactics that politicians do. And yet nothing seemed to have happened, you know, this past session. So um, one of the things that people talked about was the idea that uh, politicians hold fundraisers during the session, mm -hmm. which means basically, you know, if you, I don't know if it means this, but it implies that if you want their help, uh, you need to do something about it. And what, what do you think of all of that? Well, it, 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 it uh, I think that the legis legislature was sort of spurred into it with the uh, announcement at the beginning of the session or right before the session started with the indictments of uh, the former Senate Majority Leader uh, Kalani English and then the former representative Ty Cullen. Uh, they, they both pled guilty to what were federal charges, and they're supposed to have a sentencing date uh, later on this summer for the charges on uh, uh, political corruption, basically uh, right. taking, taking bribes uh, for, I mean, they were blatant bribes to yeah, uh, it, it, change also... uh, Senate thing. Now that that was different than the same thing than than campaign fundraising thing. So, but the legislature, in reaction to those FBI indictments, uh, did go out and uh, pass a, a bill. It was late in the Senate session. wasn't exactly sure whether or not it was going to pass, and then finally it did. That uh, limited campaign fundraising uh, and stopping it when the legislature's in session, um, I, which I, you is know, something. How much, uh, it's something, but how much good is it really? You know, they, when campaign fundraising during the session actually started because of the neighbor island uh, senators and representatives, at least that's how I remember it way back when, because, you know, they, they didn't live here uh, all year round. So they mm -hmm. took advantage of the Honolulu money so to speak, by uh, holding fundraisers. But if you know somebody's going to control your destiny, I don't know if it matters whether you hold a fundraiser in the uh, <laughs> during the session or right before it, you know, or right after. Legislators are not dumbbells, and they're going to figure out ways to uh, raise money, uh, whether it's in session or out of session. They, it, it's just something that's going to happen. Uh, and I have seen some legislators who were very blatant about making sure that everyone who testified before their uh, legislative committee was immediately sent a book of uh, fundraising Absolutely. tickets. You know, I, that I, was I, just I, a, I, I have seen that happen as well. Well, I ran into Gary Hooser uh, just a mm -hmm. couple of days ago. And he told me that his new campaign uh, is going to be, uh, and you know, push legislative push is going to be to have uh, all public financing of campaign as opposed to what we now have. He, he'd like to see all offices funded. Now, I, I Chuck Friedman and some of the other people in my, oh boy, those are old names uh, uh, in my former administration. <laughs> advocated for that. I remember we submitted a bill. Uh, I, I, I don't, and I have to confess, I wasn't what you'd call a passionate supporter at the time, but uh, we mm -hmm. submitted the bill and it, it got nowhere. But it seems like maybe that's something that we ought to reconsider. The idea that take uh, private money out of campaigns entirely. And uh, there's some advantages uh, to having all campaigns publicly financed, you know, and, and uh, what do you think? If, well, you're the, yeah. you're, you're the attorney in this conversation, and I'm not sure that you can actually legal, legally prohibit people from giving money to a candidate if they want to give money. Uh, perhaps there's a way if you say that 
now only only state money is allowed and you can't give you can't give your own money because all of the money is being given uh, on, on a um, statewide basis or a uh, publicly funded basis. Um, but there have been limits that say that, you know, it's a, it's freedom of speech to be able to give money to a candidate. And if you say that I can't give money to a candidate anymore, you're limiting my right to speak. Uh, essentially, so there's that yeah, and, and difficulty. Well, I think it, it, my understanding is that the in the past, in the past, if you made it a requirement for everyone uh, mm. to in, mm -hmm. as a qualification, you, you could do that. But with the new Supreme Court, you're correct. I mean, they just came out with a recent decision mm -hmm. that uh, regarding <laughs> Ted Cruz of all people. It says you can't limit the amount of money that a person can get reimbursed for if it's his own money or something like yes. that. But the idea yes. of public financing, I think, is so attractive. I I believe though that one of the most uh, insidious situations, I mean, is uh, when people who are in public office are allowed to hold second jobs. You know, and, yes. and and that you know it seems to me like getting caught with somebody in the car handing you money is is just stupid. Uh, that, that you know, for for five thousand dollars a month, hire the person to look out for your sewage plants, and, and the same result occurs. You know, uh, I don't see there is a distinctive difference. I know qualitatively uh but nevertheless the result may be the same you know oh Question sure there's a, there for for decades um different groups uh be them uh hotel associations or unions have uh either sponsored and encouraged someone to run for office or then after they're in office uh hire them up as their their uh, community relations uh, person, and then have a person that they would assume is going to vote their way in the legislature. Uh, it may be a little expensive way to do it, but yeah, uh, there, there are different ways to get your uh, message heard in the legislature. That's a little expensive compared to just giving them uh, $5,000 contributions, but yes, it's out there. Yeah, it's out there, and I, I think it's, it's it's rather insidious, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I I remember uh, way back in, in when we were in the Conca, and we were looking at the the legislative salaries were set in 1970, I think, at a thousand dollars a month, and it was mm -hmm. a question of how much more they should be set. That we had to deal with the issue because it was not. Uh, it wasn't flexible, but twelve thousand dollars a month—not uh, a month, but twelve thousand dollars a year in 1970 was pretty much a living wage. And the idea mm -hmm. back then was that it would make it possible for legislators not to work at all. So one of the second ideas, in addition to public financing, is this idea that uh, no legislator or politician or public office holder should be able to hold a second job. Um, and whether that would improve anything. No, in order the corollary of that would be the fact that they, are, they need to be paid some kind of a living wage, you know, at the same time. Yes. So now, if you if you did that, would, would that mean that if someone were like an attorney, they would have to stop being an attorney? Or if they were, an, they could still be an attorney, but they couldn't have any clients that uh, would then go on and, and represent various uh, groups that would be before the legislature? Well, I think right now, uh, right now, the, the attempt is to tell an attorney, for example, that mm -hmm. you ought to, you know, be avoid your conflicts of interest. But it would seem to me that even for an attorney, if you want to be in public service, you ought not to be representing uh, people that uh, 
who are, and I don't know of anybody who would not be affected by public action. I mean, even if you represented just corporation and gave that all up and went to represent people who were, in a sense, on, on well, uh, uh, on, uh, you know, maybe welfare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you still were rep would be representing an interest group. I, you know, I, I, I think the other area is board. Uh, the the legislature, the legis uh, the constitution says that the, the governor can't hold more than one job. Uh, so it's obviously it's been done. Um, I don't know. So we, we have all these reform efforts, you know, no, no fundraising during the session, no what uh, public financing, no jobs, no like. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how serious we really are about all of this. What what has been your experience just discussing this with all? I think I I I think that there is a very little uh impetus coming from the legislature and it's definitely the sort of thing that's going to have to come from citizens groups the uh, common cause type groups that are going to be able to single out uh committees and say this has got to this has got to happen the committee chairs have got to come out and do something to to change it this is the only way to, i'm going to see it it's not it's I haven't seen anyone in the legislature picking that up as a as a campaign issue. It's really hard for campaign issues are going to be bread, uh, bread and butter type issues. Uh, are you going to help with mortgages? Are you going to help with uh, child care? Are you going to help with schools? It's easier to get, you know, covered walkways for schools than it is to get someone to start worrying about the legislature. Well, I tell you, you know, you've been covering the political situation in Hawaii for uh, how many years? <laughs> you know, might be asking. You. Well, probably a little bit more than forty. Well, over the forty years, has there been any qualitative change in in the? The, the yes, yes. Of, I, th uh, I, th I think uh, I think that uh, legislators one are much more professional and much better educated, and it's not like where you get five or six people who would just say, "I don't know about that bill. I'm going to do whatever the boys want us to do." Uh, type of an attitude, and and on the other hand, at the same time, you're still going to be held sway by the power of whomever the committee chairs are in the legislature. If you've got a committee chair who's then looking to run for another office and use his or her work in, in the legislature as the reason to elect them to a bigger and better office, then yeah, you can, you can see some kind of oomph uh, following from that. But generally, you think that the uh, that the edu well, I guess what generally you thinking that the um, people today might be better educated on the issues and so forth than they were back. Oh, definitely, definitely they are. Uh, I, but it's educated as they may be. It's whether or not they feel that they have uh, the ability to go ahead and do their do their own thing, you know, or, or or they have a different group of people that that are going to be beholding. They're going to be beholding to. Well, I, I tell you what, you know, actually, uh, I'm a junkie on this kind of, as you know, <laughs> and I, I wish we had at least another half an hour or so, and I would love you to come back, uh, Richard. And uh, we, we should do this again if you don't mind. But right now, I am at um, at the closing, and I want to thank you for being the show on the show. And I, I'm saying um, we talked about campaign spending, but sometime I sure would like to talk to you about just the quality of politics in general, and maybe some of the characters that have you that that you've had the chance to uh, 
you know, work with over the years. Uh, that would well, be we always, we, but only if I can then ask you about the characters in the legislature that you've, uh, you've had to deal with. Well, I, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's so many, there's so many great stories out there. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, people would love to hear it. So again, thank yeah. you, Richard. I really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, and everyone, welcome back to, uh, you know, welcome to another talk story with John Wahee. And uh, we will be having this very special guest back again in the future. Thank you and uh, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.